Right. So, uh, welcome to Into the Pit, everybody. We're here with Jason Hellerton from Misery Index. Uh, Jason, how are you doing? I'm doing good, good. How has the... Well, it's been, uh, it's been crazy. What's it now? Almost three years with the pandemic. We sort of just thought we've got the pandemic behind us now. There's turmoil in the Ukraine. And yeah, but to tell us a little bit about how the pandemic has treated you guys. Well, much like everyone else, you know, when I guess, you know, we experienced it directly. We were on tour um, in March of 2020. Um, part of this uh, campaign for musical destruction tour with I Hate God, Rotten Sound, Napalm Death, and Bat. In the last weekend of the tour, um, as the COVID was spreading across the European continent, the uh, next to last show in Zurich was canceled, and we managed to get the last show in in, in Köln. And uh, after that, we went home, and we didn't see each other again for another year and a half Um because we live in different uh, places for the most part. And, um, you know, that was the initial thing, you know, back then it was like, oh, this is going to be over by summer. This is going to be over by blah. So there's just constant, like, waiting to see what was going to happen. So in the meantime, like a lot of other bands, we just started uh, songwriting, taking up other hobbies and doing things, you know. We're kind of a part-time band. We're not really full-time touring through the whole year. So it wasn't like, we lost like a major source of our income from not touring. Um, but we missed it for sure. Uh, we're happy things are kind of looking hopeful this year. Definitely. Yeah. Um, like you just said, I think the, it hit the bands the hardest that really rely on touring. I saw something, an interview with Schmier from Destruction, and he said that well, it was really kind of, if it wasn't for the little online show they could do and, 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 obviously working on material which probably most artists have done um they wouldn't have had much to sustain them really yeah um the german state sort of offered artists and musicians a package at first there was no mention of you know this will have to be paid back at pronto and then suddenly it was like oh well time to pay up folks and uh, so and he just said damn i'm so glad we never um accepted that you know and never never took it you know it was like considered a loan and not a grant exactly yeah. huh. and i think the scandinavian countries do it differently but they treat their artists way differently than here and one yeah. would actually expect a wealthy country like germany to support artists you know and, and sort of yeah i mean that's the way it was in finland uh here um they had artist grants you know you had to apply for them and put in you know outline your situation and uh they were grants they weren't loans yeah Modest, but still helping them to sort of, yeah, I guess bridge the the period and the time. Exactly. What what brought you to um, Helsinki? Um, well, um, I have a Finnish wife. Okay, that's the main reason, of course. <laughs> because <laughs> I've been visiting here through the years, you know, quite mm -hmm. often. And, uh, you know, dating back to the early 90s, I, I would travel and visit here, stay with pen. Back in the Tate trading days, I had I had pen pals from here, you know, had fanzines or in bands and stuff. And I you know, traveled here in the early 90s and, and kind of went around and hung out with them and stayed with them and stuff. And and that was that was, that was my first kind of, you know, eye opening experience of, about seeing how the world was and experiencing different cultures and countries and stuff. So. You know, when it came time uh, to make a choice whether to uh, move here, which my wife's home country, she has her work here and everything, it just made a lot more sense. It was easy for me to make the, make the move. Do you miss the U.S.? Yeah, yeah, I miss my family, you know, my family the most, uh, friends. You know, I'm from the state of Maryland, which, I, you know, I really enjoyed living there. I grew up there, and and it's a, it's a really cool place to be you know it's between baltimore and washington dc there's mountains there's ocean everything's kind of there so i consider yeah. myself a marylander no matter where i am in the world <laughs> that's it's the same for me I'm, I'm always a namibian and will always be and uh i miss the countryside i miss the 
the nature aspect of Namibia. Yeah. And yeah, for me, it's also like a pinia in Germany for a while now, but it, it, it's never really 100% home, you know, it's just, yeah. it works it, for now. Uh, is it called? Bintok, yeah. 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 One day Have I'll you go. ever been down south uh, on, on the African continent? No. Not yet. I'm planning. I'm, I'm planning for a birthday this year to maybe go to Zanzibar. That's about the. Hopefully, it'll be the first time. <laughs> okay. Cool. Wow. Yeah. Um. Basically, uh, yeah. What? Um. You started out with with dying fetus, of course, and uh, I think that's when I first heard you guys as well. I think re yeah, it was releases that came out via Morbid Records at the time. I recall yeah, uh, with Killing on Adrenaline. Yeah, the second album, Killing on Adrenaline, was put out by Morbid Records. Yes. In Europe in 1998. So, yeah, that was the first, uh, I guess the only, that was the only record we did with them, Cool Dudes. Okay. And, uh, and Relapse came knocking, so. <laughs> then, yeah, obviously, then you move. Yeah. But uh, sort of what, what, what sort of triggered your departure? Um... Well, I guess at that point um, in in 2000, after we we finished our uh, what would be our fourth album. Um, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I have to think about. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be it would be the third album, Destroy the Opposition. Um, uh, it was just a point in my life when I felt I wanted to try something different. I've been in the, in Dying Fetus for ten years at that point. Um, had great time. Got along with everybody great. It was cool. It was just I just had this moment where I was just felt like I had to do something different. And I wasn't I was feeling kind of stagnating and and uh went a different way to express things. And that's kind of like also in the late nineties I started getting into more like punk and hardcore and grindcore and stuff. So I envisioned a band that was kind of like a, a death metal band at its core and um but had those kind of like elements of hardcore and grind and punk that was you know weren't a part of the music 100 percent, but it was there it was like that you know that visceral kind of energy the, you know the hardcore like tension it was a, that rabid energy that was just a part of a lot of that you know based on real world kind of material frustrations that to me was like what i really wanted to get more into and <clears throat> so that's how misery index kind of came out of that okay from the uh the title obviously inspired from essek yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that was a huge influence on. I just great band. Rip me, just rip the, you know, rip my face off. Like as much as I love the, you know, the brutal death metal and everything that we were doing in the '90s, there was just something just way more like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, intense. It's it's just... substance of it. You know, there's something more. There's a visceral reality to it to what they were doing when they have when you have when you're screaming about something. I don't know. I guess that has more meaning or whatever for your for yourself or for your you know present modern existence or whatever so channel wanted to channel that into death metal and, and of course misery index still has vestiges of fetus i guess in its styles so in some it creeps in every now and then but it's not like a yeah so that's uh, i would uh, i would find that 100 percent um it's even your earlier albums i've always notice this is not just pure death metal there is a strong hardcore edge to it and um grind obviously and i even i even find myself uh, stumbling over thrash influences you know yeah. very thrashy parts um very melodic parts as well not just hammering it out basically but um and that for me con continues through to complete control your latest one I've had, I've had a few, I had a bit of time to spin it now. Obviously, not that intensely, but I can, I can still see that sort of signature in the music. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, well, myself and Darren, the uh, lead guitarist, are, you know, we grew up in the '80s and we're, you know, at a heart very much metalheads and very much grew up on '80s metal, and that is sort of the foundation for everything we do. I think so. That is going to creep in. Those types of, especially in like song structures, you know, we still kind of keep a verse chorus kind of mm. to it. You know, we like that sort of, you know, traditional approach to songwriting rather than having like 20 different riffs in a row kind of song. 
Um, so yeah, that combined with um, with Mark's songwriting, he was, he's 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 younger than us, and he he grew up in the '90s more so, and has a different approach to songwriting as well. So I think when we all we all write songs for the band equally, so when it comes together, we have this kind of output, which kind of brings in all those varied influences in equal measure. Okay. So. Yeah, you basically answered my question. I, I was going to get a bit more precise. Um, what was for you the album um, or the song, for that matter, that basically changed your life, that made you decide, I'm going to you know, be a fan, number one, and I'm going to make this kind of, I want to make this kind of music? Well, I mean, you know, early teenage years, like a lot of kids, in the, in the 80s were who gravitated towards hard rock you know I, li I liked you know the motley crew you know the white snake docking that kind of stuff it was the initial gateway drug if you will yeah if i see in the videos on mtv but of course you know, then i noticed iron maiden um and, and the next sort of level of things but yeah i think it was once i saw iron maiden probably somewhere in time Yeah. That album. That was my start as well. The Wasted Years video, um, yeah. which came on in the middle of all the hair metal videos and just stood out. I was like, this, there's something way cooler about this than yeah. the, the art, this, whatever. <laughs> which I still Mind love. You that. They've got Yannick now, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, this is before Yannick was in the band. Yeah. I don't know. Nothing against him, but I'm definitely in, in an 80s metal. I mean, the uh, 80s maiden aficionado, even the Diano stuff, of course. Um, Absolutely. But, yeah. yeah, I would say it was maiden, you know, and from there it was just like open the door, go to the record store and find out. And uh, from there it was like all the, you know, sabotage, fate's warning, trouble to the noise record stuff. And then it was like creators, you know, Halloween, Sodom, all the. And then. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and then the combat stuff like Forbidden and uh, and uh, Dark Angel, things like that. And then... Awesome. And, <laughs> and then I just watched Revenge uh, last night again. The Ultimate Revenge. Yeah. With Part Forbidden, what was it? Faith of Fear. Yeah. Raven. Death. Yeah, there was two parts. And then yeah, the other one, a Death, Dark Angel... I mean, that Dark Angel show just, just destroys. That's probably one of my biggest influences. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Reinhardt comes out like a maniac running around on stage, like the singer for Dark Angel at the time. But, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. of course. And that, you know, led to death metal. And, you know, once I heard death, obituary, this first, you know, proto-death metal albums, You know, that came out in the late 80s. Those were the ones that, you know, drew me into that world. And, and it went from there, it was just a quest to get heavier and more brutal. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it was actually interesting what I sort of over the years have encountered. In the 80s, I was like, obviously, I had my thrash wave before the death metal movement started. And um, I was never really sort of, I never really caught onto the whole punk thing back then. Um, sure, there was SOD. But I found myself not really analyzing it too much. They had a different sound. That was all. And then only later, many years later, did I discover bands like, you know, Discharge and, and Minor Threat. And and that's where I actually, and then obviously what comes to mind immediately is, is Jeff Hanneman with all these stickers, Dead Kennedys, that kind of stuff. And then you sort of, you, you put on Rain and Blood again and you listen to it differently and you see you actually see that that whole franticness and the, the sort of hecticness of it all, of the songs, is, is really largely due to the, the, the hardcore punk influences. Must be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the same trajectory for me. It wasn't until the late 90s that I, you know, went back and just started actually sitting down and finding bands like Dead Kennedys, to the crust, the crust stuff, like Disrupt. Yes, Disrupt, yeah. Awesome. I opened the door for, like, a new way to, you know, to go with it, and it just kind of aligned with where I was at the time. 
And then I must commend you on, uh, whilst we're also talking about the whole death metal movement, um, years ago, um, Dominic, our mutual friend in Berlin, yeah. actually uh, recommended, in the one day he said, uh, listen, I'm reading a book, you have to read this. Because I used to always sort of talk to him about, you know, wow, the recording techniques, what did Scott Burns do? And, yeah. you know, oh, that was poof, amazing. And, and especially because Dominic is on the sound engineering side. Yeah. And he said, no, no, read this book. This will give you some nice pointers. And I must commend you. I mean, I, I, I went through that book like a hot knife through butter. <laughs> it was so cool. Finally getting sort of the sort of like inside reports on, on, on the Florida scene. And, you know, and I think you touched on, on, on bands like Suffocation as well. Yeah, I tried, whole, to, I tried to do what I could in the time I had and who would talk to me and yeah, you know, there's, there are some people who might be seen as key players like missing from the, but that wasn't the point. The point was to get a broad picture from many voices. So, you know, while there, it is missing some who, you know, just didn't want to talk to me or didn't have time or whatever. Um, I think who I did get in the hundred or so hundred plus interviews kind of, captures that kind of structure of feeling that was the death metal underground at the time and so glad you enjoyed it <laughs> yeah absolutely no i felt it was stellar what do you um often when I, even today when i when i take out those albums effigy of the forgotten um the death albums um gorguts uh, you name them i always go damn it that was such a rich and pummelingly heavy sound i mean malevolent creation yeah you don't find that anymore. The sound has become, for many bands, it's become so clean. Yeah, it's hard. You know, there's actually, you know, as you know, and many do, like during the, the turn to digital recording technology around the turn of the century up to the 2000s, it was kind of characterized by a, you know, a hyper refinement of all the instruments to a, mm. a sterile kind of approach to the drums and the guitar tones and, and the so-called, you know, brick wall mastering and the loudness kind of aspect of it that kind of, you know, I think that a lot of people were just excited about this new technology and just jumping ahead without considering. Mm. Um, so I think the last, the 10 years after that up till now have been kind of this reassessment and like pushback against it. And there are like productions now, which I think are, there's even a kind of new wave of, you know, of old school death metal bands that are very much immersed in that kind of those old, you know, early autopsy sounds and you know, the primitiveness. Back, back to that rawness, huh? Atmosphere. It's, yeah, there's, I mean, the death metal underground today, as it stands, is, is, is very much populated with that kind of stone, tone and sound. So it's people have like returned to it and are, you know, reveling in it. And, uh, you know, with our new album, it's, it was a challenge, too. Like, we want to have our sound as real as possible. We want to get, like, natural tones, and we strive for that. And we, went, we, went, we were months mixing it, partially because the engineer had other things, too. But, um, you know, that was in our heads all the time. Like, we want to capture, like, the real tones and get to the real... Um, <sighs> Get to the real essence of the music, and that's I think we did. We're very happy with it. And no, it's only crushing, huh? In the modern context of things. Yes, yes. No, it just shows you. Um, I've, I've recently had a discussion with a younger fan, a younger generation fan, and uh, I think I played him um, "Retribution" by uh, by Malevolent. Yeah. And I said, like, that is. I mean. That, that album sounds menacing, you know, it's, it's just... Yeah, I love it. But, but, but what, you, what this person immediately picked out is, yeah, but I have to crank it so that, you know, it comes up and loud. And I said, well, that's because your ears are so used to a wall of volume. Yeah, you know? well, all pop music today is, is mastered very loud. And, it's, of course, you have to look at the media, too, and, you know, the role of streaming services... And, you know, they almost have to mix for all these different types of, of uh, media, whether, you know, different for streaming, for Bandcamp, for vinyl, you know, yeah. for CD. <laughs> so there's... Exactly. I think that's that also played a huge role because 
I mean, in the end, if you, if you, if you compare, if you think back to now the, the old analog way, think of Morris Sound or, or, or Horus Sound here in Germany or whatever, and those big productions and the, the desks and everything, it's, it's so, such an ironic picture in my head, um, thinking of those used Neve desks or whatever, and then <laughs> seeing someone, a young metalhead, going, <laughs> you know, listening to yeah. the, on this little device here, you know, it comes through this huge box. It's almost yeah. like yeah. yeah, I mean, all the effort they've used to put in and like send them to these mastering studios, like Master Disc or Hit Factory or whatever. I don't know what they were, but George Marino, yeah, Marino, Bob Clear Mountain. I don't know, these kind of like classic audio mastering guys that would get it pristine for you know vinyl press or something. And yeah, and I mean, now you can record and you can do everything on your laptop for the pro, yeah. Make sure your levels are good and then have it mixed, you know? Yeah, well, I know some, there's a band, uh, I know bands that, you know, even in, in Helsinki here, like younger bands, there's a thriving kind of new generation of, of like teenage death metal bands here. And a lot of them are just recording themselves in their rehearsal room, you know, on their laptops with like, or they just set it all up and trial and error it. And it's just, yeah. Yeah. so, and they're, they're kind of getting that kind of raw sound from that. It's just a, you know, it's, you know, there's just no, like, one way, right way to do it, I guess, this, these days, there's so many ways you can go about it. I find it amazing that with the, today's technology that a lot of these bands, I mean, uh, uh, now that we're talking, um, a band like Corpsest comes to mind. I think they're from your neck of the woods there. And um, how they achieve that raw sound. I mean, it's, it's if you listen to it on cans, it's, it's like you're standing in that practice room. And it's yeah, just, that's Every instrument is so raw and oh, it just crushes. It's heavy, you know, and um, that they get that they manage that without having a huge analog temple to do it in. You know, yeah, that, that's a perfect example. Bands like you know, Corpsest, uh, Morbific, Galvanizer, Cryptic Hatred, they're all kind of doing this, and and they have an atmosphere and a way about it here in Finland that a lot of the bands kind of you know strive for that kind of you know uh, organic kind of production atmosphere centered productions yeah no cool so um you talked about you touched on um when i asked you about the move to to misery index and and and, and uh, what i sort of distilled from what you said is, is that you know that the sort of message behind the music is something important and um i just looked at your I mean, from the first time I heard Misery Index, really, and, and, and with titles like Airs to Thievery, and, you know, the, the, I think there's a lot of social criticism, a lot of political themes, uh, uh, the sort of things that are going wrong with the world, the sort of the state of the art of the world messages in there. Yeah, is that, cool. that is still a very strong thing, even on, on complete control. Yeah, very much so. Um, you know, it just, it goes back to like, I feel like, you know, when we're up there screaming, you know, on stage or on the record that, you know, we, it's so much, it means so much more to, to have some, uh, to be screaming about something you're kind of passionate about or like, or actually calling out, you know, real world problems and issues and injustices. So that's where we kind of like tied ourselves loosely to the you know the napalm death tradition um you know centered on basic questions I mean what 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 is it what is what does it mean to live a good life what is it what is it what is the best way for you know us all to have a good life and a healthy society and you know is what the way the world is going now is this a good thing or a bad thing how can it be done better and I never wanted to use like hypercritical uh, lyrics in the sense that they're preachy. I always like to use a lot of metaphor and allegory in the lyrics and in order for the, if someone is interested in the lyrics, um, if they go into reading them, they might find something interesting there and, and might get their own interpretation out of them. So are you the main lyricist? Yeah, I've, I guess I've, uh, through the years, I've done about 80 to 90 percent. Mark usually gets a couple in on the record as well. Um, and he shares the same perspective. And uh, 
I guess what it comes down to is at the core, at our core, you know, or we we're a death metal band, we're a metal band, and we like we want our songs to be the main focus first and foremost. The riffs we write, that's kind of like the like for example, the message and the lyrics, which are they're important, aren't like they don't sort of like stand out away from the music. To me, it's like the music is the most important thing. And if we can write good songs and write good riffs, then the lyrics are kind of like the secondary, like, you know, icing on the cake that kind of packages it all correctly for us. Yeah, us. I was, I think with Napalm, it's a notch up, eh? the, the lyrical content and the messages, I would say. Um, yeah, I, I mean, no, they an even split there. Yeah. Waiting. That, Barney is like a, a force. In nature, I mean, he's his energy on stage is, is just cannot be matched, and you know his power as a front man, as a vocalist, and you know a orator or what have you um, is is unparalleled. So that aspect of it, for sure, um, elevates them and their and and their message as well. I guess we're more of a uh, we have more balance in that department. I don't know, but we definitely share the same sort of ideological views as them and and have the same sort of approach to it but uh we are I, we are i think we are more closer to death metal then i, I guess then and as they have more roots in, in grindcore I, I guess and uh even though they've gravitated more towards death metal at times in their careers we've i guess been more of a death metal band that's gravitated more towards grind and punk on our margins through the years so <laughs> Yeah, and then obviously they've got all these other crazy influences, Swans and, you know. Yeah, Oak and, yeah. All the show. So um, now with the album out, uh, do you have any dates in Europe planned? Um, any, like, dates? Yeah, um, we're, uh, first thing we're doing is in about two weeks or three weeks, we're going to do a U.S.-Canada tour. Doing... I don't know, about 20 shows there, kind of testing things out, seeing how the, we're going to go do with the you know, the COVID restrictions and how things are going to unfold. Um, and then we're going to do a weekend around Hellfest in in June, and then we're going to do a longer festival run in August, which includes stops like you know Alcatraz Fest, Summer Breeze, Party Sun, Brutal Assault. You know, there's a lot of those, those. So we'll be there most of August and then hopefully back for a headliner in uh, November. Awesome. That's what we have right so far. Yeah, if nothing puts the spanner in the works again. <laughs> my, mother, uh, my mother texted me uh, last night, apparently, and uh, my mother lives in Namibia still. Yeah. And she got word that apparently in Botswana, the neighboring state, they found another strain. Well, this so, is the bubble, whatever the... So, <laughs> Omnicrom 2, obviously, but, um, yeah, so I'm keeping my ears peeled at the moment and constantly writing to my relatives to find out what uh, is it spreading, what is it, you know. Yeah. So let's yeah. hope it's not another thing. Yeah, there's that, you know, and we got a bigger problem now here at least in, in, to the east <laughs> yes which uh hopefully um you know might not expand from there and can be i don't know it's Con contained if yeah it's a heavy like top here especially in finland but, um yeah. yeah yeah it's 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 like handling nitroglycerin really at the moment hey? well, what what can how much can you do you know it's really it's almost like you and where will will Putin stop? And you know, yeah, yeah it's insane. Yeah. I never thought I'd see it this day and age. Yeah. Same here. Mm. And they actually had a, a clip of German politicians, three of them, recently, stating vehemently that put uh, a theory of Putin attacking Ukraine is just absurd. <laughs> and somebody cut it together to music <laughs> you have it you know 
Yeah, I think everyone underestimated his, uh, I don't know, his ego, his egocentric sort of sociopathic uh, will to force like some sort of new glory uh, for the country by military um, endeavor. <laughs> Do you, do you think he's a man that now is obviously in, a, in the latest stages of his life and he wants to make a mark? He wants to go into history and sort of be mentioned in the same breath as, say, a Stalin or the likes? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I mean, I would say that he's, I mean, I know, we all know he's like an old Cold War guy. He's a KGB guy, mm. he came up in that world in a time when the Soviet Union was, you know, a global force, um, part of a bipolar world uh, between the United States and and uh, its allies and the Soviet Union, which had equal standing. And since the, there was a lot of pride lost in the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the 1990s there, and, and I'm sure he carries that weight, you know, that sort of, that that loss, which in a lot of ways for those guys was probably pretty humiliating. Um, so if you want to look at some psychological level there that maybe uh, Putin you know, is, is on a personal level seeking to rectify things and at least capture some sort of former Glory. <laughs> extension, of, you know, extension of Russian influence over the region. Um, it's, uh, it's just very, very tragic that he's choosing to do it through violence so yes that's what i said to someone the other day i mean if if the encroaching nato and all that is such a big thing for him he could have done the same he could have started sanctioning he could have started listen i'm going to turn the gas tap off um you know and start negotiating that way at least you know and instead of just belligerently falling in and, and leveling cities like mariupol yeah, I mean, I'm not a scholar of Russian history, anything, but I think that, you know, I mean, they have so many resources and, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of skilled people. And if there, was, if there wasn't such corruption and, uh, and if the money they were making from, from uh, their, their new engage, recent, the last engagement with the global economy over the last two decades was channeled into more productive things like infrastructure, education, development um they could have had a different way to um elevate the status of russia um than by doing these military sort of adventures yeah i'm not an expert or anything we're just two metalheads here talking about it but <laughs> exactly we can only guess and, and make our own sort of rhyme out of it yeah, yeah. sure for sure but it I is a world now so it is a, a topic <laughs> yes cool that about covers it from my side um they mean um i would like to underneath the video when i post it um if possible put in some dates that you have confirmed yeah some links yeah they're all all of our uh tour dates are on our on our launch pot like miseryindex.com has everything okay. has videos you know, the latest updates and all the tour dates so awesome so i can just post that underneath yeah <laughs> and uh, will you be yeah i guess you mentioned a couple of festivals i'm just i always think i'm somewhere i'm, I'm about an hour from hanover so i always try and see the bands <laughs> when they yeah. come into my vicinity obviously i'm not going to travel all the way to uh, the other side of the country but um so i'll yeah. be keeping my eyes peeled yeah, we're doing club shows too around the festival. So mm. if you notice like it's in the area, definitely hit me up and you know, yes. a post or whatever. If you want to come out and have a beer. For sure. I'll check it out. <laughs> I'll see what comes up. What's the beer official national beer of Namibia? The national beer of Namibia, Tafel Lager. So they do they have the brewing tradition there, which was brought with, with the uh, the German uh, immigrants. To tell you what, uh, it's the only country in Africa that brews according to the Reinheitsgebot. Okay. And they've kept that going. There's, there's over the years, because uh, when I used to live there, I was in the um, advertising business. Yeah. And uh, one of our clients was the Namibian Brewery. 
Now, and through those years, there was always that threat of SAB Miller. Uh, I think SAB Miller swallowed up so many US beer companies that they were actually one of the biggest conglomerates in the world. And obviously that giant Kraken uh, always threatened to sort of swallow up. And the Namibians fought bravely and they're still solid there. Like they have an independent brewing culture. Yes, yes. I think I think they had Diageo in there or, or Heineken. They got they had to uh, bolster themselves with 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 some shares and stuff. So they're not a hundred percent, but I, at least they're still holding the flag up. Yeah, right on. That's the visit someday. <laughs> you have to try it. I'll send you a a pack shot. So you can familiarize yourself. <laughs> okay. Cool. Sounds good. Jason, have a good one. You too, Johan. Thanks for the chat. I hope it's uh, something you can use. Yeah, I'll send you a link with it up. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.